everybody and welcome to another brand new episode of T Watches a Scary Movie. My name is T and of course we're talking scary movies. I appreciate you tuning in for another brand new episode. Remember, new episodes go up every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Mountain Standard Time if you're looking for the audio only version and the video version goes up at 8.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Just got to go to youtube.com slash C slash Theron Reynolds Scary Movie. Again, youtube.com slash C slash Theron Reynolds Scary Movie. Audio version, just search Twasm or T Watches a Scary Movie. You'll find it that way. Or you can use my link tree. Go to linktr.ee slash T Scary Movie, and that'll give you the links to the YouTube page, the audio versions of the show, the TikTok, the Twitter, whatever you need to follow along, even my written reviews on Letterboxd. So get subscribed now so you can stay up with all the new stuff that I have coming to y'all. This week, you are in for a treat, or at least I hope you're in for a treat, folks. Around this time last year, I went over eight films as a part of the After Dark Horror Fest, the eight films to die for. This is a film festival that came around back in 2006, and it brought a bunch of independent filmmakers, writers, directors together to put together uh, some films that were going to re be released as a part of this one-of-a-kind horror festival. All the films ended up getting these uh, these really good uh, DVD releases, and then they kept the festival going over the subsequent years. Now, last year, when we did year one, we went over a number of films that I had seen before, and the number ones I had it because I didn't check them all out. And now that we're in, in year two, uh, that's the same thing that seems to be happening. We got a fresh set of eight films to die for for you. Year two of the After Dark Horror Fest was in 2007. So I had seen the majority of those films, but I've been liking going back and getting a chance to revisit them because I see them in a different light than the way that I originally did when I watched them over, uh, over 15 years ago at this point. So that is what we are breaking into here over the next week or so. Uh, we got eight films to get through. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about the first two, which is going to be Borderland and Crazy Eight. And then I'm going to be dropping reviews for uh, the, deaths, uh, the Deaths of Ian Stone, as well as Lake Dead. Those should be coming out later this week. And then next week, we're going to hit our other four. So you got to make sure you're staying tuned and that you're subscribed so you can keep up with it. This time, we are going to score the films. And this is going to actually take me forward with what I'm going to be doing on the show after this episode as well, is that on Letterbox, y'all know that I actually have to give a ranking to the films themselves uh, between one and five stars. So what better place to start incorporating that into the show itself? So we're going to rank these films at the end of them, and we're going to find out what's going to end up being best of show by the end of next week, okay? But don't want to waste anybody else's time. We're going to jump right into our first film. The amount of nostalgia that has been coming back to me in the last week from re-watching the films of year two of the After Dark Horror Fest is immeasurable. I mean, regardless of whether I liked or disliked any of the particular films, I can still remember uh, the excited feeling I had to just check all of them out. Year One had a lot of actors that I knew from various projects. Dominic Purcell, uh, Claire Kramer, Scout Taylor Compton, Chloe Moretz, Rachel Miner, all of which are actors who we know from like various horror projects and a bunch of other stuff. You know, Blade, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, Halloween, and even more than that. And that had me really pumped for year two, just because I figured with the festival gaining more traction and more publicity, that that was gonna attract more and more recognizable names in terms of actors to come and do a lot of these films. And they definitely were able to attract a lot more with sometimes the cast being a bigger draw than the film itself. Crazy Eights tells the story of a group of six estranged childhood friends who all receive invitations to the funeral of a seventh, uh, and they re uh, find out that they're receiving an inheritance of a treasure map that leads them to a corpse and the subsequent worst day of all of their lives. Dina Meyer, uh, uh, George Newbern, Tracy Lords, Frank Whaley, uh, Gabrielle Anwar, and Dawn DeLuca make up the sextet that's spending this last day together. Now, that's a pretty impressive cast for a film of this type. What makes it all the more a shame that they don't utilize them to the best of their abilities. I mean, 
Horror films typically do better than other genres when it comes to balancing large cast. And typically that's because you're going to end up killing off 50 to 60 percent of your cast over the course of the film. Not saying that's every, everyone obviously, and that was only at a certain time, but for a while, that's what was happening in horror films. And of course, we have plenty of ones where nobody dies, plenty of ones where only one or two people die, plenty of ones where everybody dies. Like that always happens. But most horror films for a certain time, they were killing off 50 to 60% of their films, so or 50 to 60% of their cast. So having a larger cast didn't really hurt them negatively. It didn't really affect them because they were gonna get rid of most of this cast over like 40 to 60 minutes anyway until we get to our big finale. And the problem is, is that Crazy H just stumbles right out of the gate when it comes to this because it has such a short runtime. 80 minutes seems long. 80 minutes does seem like it's a long amount of time, but realistically, the problem with that is that we're not actually given equal amount of time on any of these characters. Like we get a bit of a prologue that kind of sets the stage for what's going on. And I say kinda very harshly. And we get some character traits from like these various people. I mean, for example, Frank Whaley's Brent is the asshole who clearly doesn't want to be a part of any of this at all. He doesn't want to reminisce. He doesn't want to reconnect with his friends. He just wants to be gone at this point and as far away from the rest of them as humanly possible. Uh, Gabrielle Anwar's character, Beth, uh, she can definitely tell for some reason that something bad is about to happen to all of them. There's something that she's feeling trepidation about as they're getting into this situation, but she can't really place her finger on to what. And even Dina Meyer's Jennifer, uh, she's the one that's trying to keep calm and keep within reason as everything just descends into absolute madness. But this is just mostly like service level character work. It's not really giving us much else to latch on to these characters with. And it stinks because the cast really is so, so good. A lot of these people I follow in a bunch of other projects that they've done. I know they have the ability, and it's not that they're acting particularly bad in this. They're all really, really good actors. But it's just the material itself is not enough that these guys can elevate that. I don't know much of anybody who probably could. And I hate saying that, but it, it, it's the truth. The material for them just isn't as strong as it should be. And with that, we can kind of piece together the evil that's haunting this group within this abandoned hospital and i will say to their credit like to the credit of the filmmakers the death scenes are in are, are really really creepy director jimmy jones is able to make the less is more concept actually work perfectly here because with a lot of scenes um we're uh like we're either like focused on the very visceral part of it or it's just kept right out of eyesight, like very, very barely out of eyesight in here. Uh, one of the more, one of the more prevalent ones being George Newburn, who gets ooh an ouch, 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 ouch death scene for sure. That would have helped if he had uh, superpowers in that one, which. Justice League reference. That's a Superman for those of y'all who are Justice League fans like myself. Um, but more often than not, like the death scenes are happening out of frame to where we're left to just kind of hear what's happening and kind of build that imagination for ourselves. And considering that the deaths in this film keep coming like rather quickly because it's such a short run, uh, run time, it's actually one of the more positive, uh, positive sides of the film is that we're getting all these different deaths that are happening just quickly. They're going on. They keep us interested, I suppose. That, uh, but with that, I would balance that out by saying having some better rules for the villain would have really helped things like seem like they were uh, they were coming on an even playing field. Because the problem is, is that while it's not uncommon for horror films to put characters in situations they can't get out of and just be mean to them, Crazy Eights uh, tries to make up for that by giving the characters an idea of how to stop the haunting, but. It's just not enough because we're not given any reason for why these characters are being uh, killed in the first place, the order in which they're being killed, much of anything else. So 
it feels like we're just here to see people die. Like a lot of stuff kind of got thrown at the wall and they just kind of kept what was scraped off of it. That was all that they were doing. And so while the deaths are good, the problem is, is that we still don't get much of a compelling villain, which if you combine that with like the main cast that we just don't get to know that well, we don't have a villain, we don't have heroes, all we have are deaths. It's really lacking in that story department. And it becomes even more glaring if you start thinking back to year one of the After Dark Horror Fests because they had a film called The Grave Dancers about a group of friends who attend the funeral of another and they end up raising three murderous spirits who haunt them, which sounds very much like Crazy Eights. And intentional or not, it's hard to see how these two, like these two stories, like that they, they don't mirror each other. They really do. Honestly, Crazy Eights has the better cast. Grave Dancers does a better job of telling the same story. But realistically, these could have been in the same universe, honestly. Um, I could see, like, regardless of the way you structure them out there, I could see that the characters in the first film, the group that's kind of fighting off this haunting, could have been uh, could have been kids at the same uh, like uh, the same mental institution, the same hospital that the characters of Crazy Eights were at. That absolutely would have worked perfectly. And it brought up another point to me, to where it seems weird we haven't gotten any sequels to any of the After Dark Horror Fest films yet. I really feel that this like this series as a whole has given us good enough stories to where at least some of them should have seen a follow-up. And I realize going from year one to year two, that's that might be a bit too immediate. And a lot of independent directors that quickly aren't gonna pick somebody else's idea up. But it's kind of interesting that we didn't get a follow-up to any of the earlier films and like the later uh, festivals that came around. I don't know, but I digress. There's very clearly a good idea here with Crazy Eights, but unfortunately the execution is just not there. It doesn't make it memorable at all. And I found myself thinking quite often of The Grave Dancers, which was a better execution of the same exact premise. Cast is better for sure in Crazy Eights, but the story is just not there. It's a step in the right direction for the festival because the story and the runtime don't offer much to the viewer, and I know that should be important, but the fact that these kind of films are attracting bigger actors uh, actors to them and we're getting these more robust casts, that's always going to be a win for a festival like this. So here's hoping we get to some stronger tales to make up the remaining stories we have here with year two. So right now, my ranking. Crazy Eights is going to get two out of five stars. That's right, two out of five. While the death scenes are memorable and there's a fantastic cast in this film, the problem is, is that the story drops the ball too much between getting us introduced to the characters and getting us introduced to the villains. It just doesn't make it for a truly enjoyable runtime. So, you can check out Crazy Eights. It's available to rent or purchase on most streaming platforms right now, folks. Stay tuned. I'll be back after these messages with my review of Borderland. Hey, everybody. Looking for a great way to stay up to date on horror news as well as read the best of articles on anything scary out in the world right now? Then you need to head over to the Fangoria shop and get yourself a subscription. If you go to shop.fangoria.com slash AXDW, you can use my own personalized 20% discount to save 20% off on Fangoria Magazine subscriptions, as well as 20% off any other items in their fantastic shop. This is a great deal. If you've ever been wanting to get yourself a subscription, now is the time to do so. Head to shop.fangoria.com slash AXDW. Welcome back to T-Watch is a Scary Movie, everybody. Uh, we just got done talking Crazy Eights, which I gave a two out of five star ranking to. And now we are gonna talk Borderland. Not Borderlands, not plural, Borderland. Yes, so back in 2007, I had left my job as a product specialist at Circuit City, which was recently demolished, the one that I was working with, RIP. Good memories from that place. Uh, but I left it to take a job as a shift leader at Blockbuster. Uh, regardless of the fact that I was taking a higher position than when I was working at Circuit City, I think anybody with a brain could tell you it was a lateral move. But that never really mattered to me just because 
I'm a cliche horror geek. I always wanted to work at a video store. One of my best friends, his parents ended up buying a video store um, right around the time we were getting out of high school and I thought it was the coolest thing. Like, you own a video store. Like, that is so, so cool. And like, Yellow Jackets has Van owning a video store right now, which is super dope. Just either way, being a horror nerd, like, owning a video store is like, that's a list of achievements right there. Working at one, that works as well too. But the thing was is that no matter how bad retail is, uh, it actually ended up being one of my all time favorite jobs. And that's saying a lot because Blockbuster went under not too long after I left them. I wasn't there for too, too long. I think I did about a year and a half or so there, maybe two years, and then I was gone. So I wasn't there for too, too long there. But oh man, Blockbuster was such a good job. And one of the reasons why is because we had these perks, the best of which being that employees got to rent movies before they were actually released, typically one to two weeks early. Uh, it was pretty much one of the only perks we got. But again, as a horror nerd, it was fantastic because um we would see things come in way earlier than anybody would know we'd check them out and be like ha i saw that movie before you and this is before uh pirating was as commonplace as it is now so it's kind of funny to say that because back then a lot of people could have been making a lot of money that way but i digress um i can still remember working uh, when they came in because we'd always get a shipment of movies that would come in you crack them every thursday and there would be the new releases and Immediately as I opened this box back in 2007, I'm seeing the, the, the branding up at the top for the eight films to die for, and I knew what it was. Uh, I Just because, again, I had been following this festival after year one and loving all these movies that came out, I wasn't going to let that happen a second time that I didn't catch it right when it was going down. And so I decided that it was time to rent them. And I did. I rented the majority of year two of the After Dark Horror Fest and man, did I have such a blast with it. Now, we've talked about Crazy Eights already. That was a film that I gave two out of five. So we're now gonna go ahead and talk about Borderland. And the one thing I didn't really uh, pay that much attention to when I was younger that I definitely picked up now here is that Borderland was actually loosely based on a true story. The story of the film is about these three college grads who end up taking a trip down to Mexico for a weekend to unwind, but they may end up staying a little longer than they like after one of the three is kidnapped by an evil cult of drug smugglers. Now, when I originally saw the film, again, it does let you know it's loosely based off of true events, but Again, this back in 2007, it still wasn't as easy or commonplace to search for, uh, like search for just random articles like it is now. And I know that's like, that seems weird because it's 2007, but Wikipedia wasn't as, uh, Wikipedia has obviously grown quite a bit in the, uh, in the, the, the 16, the 15 years since then. It has grown quite a bit at that point. And back in the spring of 1989, Mark Kilroy, who was a, a, a junior at the University of Texas, was kidnapped and tortured while vacationing in Mexico during spring break. Now, there was no kind of vendetta against Kilroy, nor was this motivated by any kind of ransom. The cult that kidnapped him believed that by offering human, uh, human sacrifice, it would grant them immunity from law enforcement for their drug smuggling operations. It didn't. And like I said, I didn't pay much to it being based on a true story, but it's hard to ignore that now because we're definitely in an age to where serial killers and their various actions that they're taking around the country are getting more noticed. There's TV shows, there's movies. We've been in murder culture for a while, but this has been gigantic, just the, the, the surge of it in the last five years or so. And... Back in 07 when this came out, we had just gotten films like uh, like Hostel, Wrong Turn, uh, Vacancy, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Beginning. These are all films that uh, they fit the same aesthetic of a group of, a group of people or a duo end up in the wrong place at the wrong time and they're ultimately taken advantage of by the locals. And Borderland may fit perfectly into that mold. But that doesn't mean it's anything close to perfect, which I'm not saying a lot of those other films are perfect, but yeah, they, they, they succeed just a little bit more. With just under a two hour runtime, it obviously doesn't have the same problems 
that Crazy Eights did. But it makes it feel all the more interesting that by the end of the film, I didn't feel like I was more endured to our leads. Like, how does that happen? That on one film, we get barely over an hour, and obviously we don't get enough time with our characters. But in another film where we're getting uh, yeah, just under two hours, it feels like we still don't have enough time with them. We can't make three and four hour films like this, all right? Lord of the Rings and whatever Martin Scorsese wants to do, whatever. But this can't be a three or a four hour film, y'all. Um, we have Henry, played by Jake Muxworthy. He's the stereotypical alpha male who wants his friends to engage in as much depravity, depravity as possible so he doesn't feel as bad and embarrassed about himself and what he's doing with his life. Uh, but his character isn't really a cause for any of the trouble they get into, and he's an asshole, but he doesn't end up being the reason that anything that anything bad happens to him. So he's just an asshole to be an asshole. You have Phil, played by Ryder Strong. Y'all know Ryder Strong, Boy Meets World. Um, and he's the innocent younger friend who's looking to lose his virginity and winds up kidnapped for his trouble. And finally, we have Ed, played by Brian Presley, who is reevaluating what he wants with his life. And after meeting bartender Valeria, played by Martha Hegrea, uh, he de decides that he wants to end up taking up humanitarian work similar to the Peace Corps. Um, I don't I, I don't know. When I was looking at the cast, it, it, it's hard not to play favorites just because you always kind of flock to who you know and who most of us probably know in this is Ryder Strong. And I, I get it because I, I, I'm a big, big fan of uh, Boy Meets World and I'm a big fan of Ryder Strong. I like Cabin Fever as well too. But... What's interesting is that Ryder gets to play not only uh, like the first half of his screen time with the other two, but then he plays the other half of his screen time with Sean Astin. Yes, that Sean Astin from The Goonies, Stranger Things, Lord of the Rings, um, who actually is playing like a more psychotic and unhinged version of Doug from Fifty First Dates. Uh, let me know in the comments if you watch this or you're gonna check it out. I need to know if I'm crazy when I'm say uh, like when I say that because I totally think he's just playing a whacked out version of Doug who's already very whacked out. Um, but it's a much different role for Sean Astin, and that makes his scenes with Ryder Strong all the more interesting to watch because he's really been given a chance to play dis uh, despicable characters like this throughout his career and it seems very much like he's enjoying getting to do something completely different from what he typically does now all due respect to brian presley but i feel as if zev berman the writer and director would have benefit more from swapping brian presley and writer strong's role just because uh, Presley just doesn't seem comfortable with the material and he really only looks confident in the last 15 minutes or so when it's all just action scenes that are happening. Um, and not only that, but like if you go and you look up Mark Kilroy, the actual victim which this is all based on, it just seems like Brian Presley kind of fits that mold of, uh, of Mark Kilroy more than Ryder Strong does. Um, and definitely would be a more interesting dynamic scene, strong face off with the cult instead, because Presley does come off, hence his kind of background, I don't mean to hold this against him, but Presley does come off as like, you know, this football player who had the world going for him and just decided out of nowhere, hey, changing everything that I'm going to do. And it's very, very cliche. It's not all that interesting. Whereas somebody like Ryder Strong in that role would definitely uh, be more of a challenge for him to play. And because of that, it would just be that much more interesting, in my opinion. Now, there is a fair share of blood in this film. I mean, the opening scene establishes the brutal and barbaric method of this cult. And limbs get cut off, machetes uh, cut the various people down, eyes get pulled out. There's plenty in here to like as a fan of gore, uh, which is a must because it helps make up for the shortcomings of the story. And I know for a fact that I enjoyed this film a lot more in 2007 when I initially saw it. I wasn't watching too many independent films at the time, especially independent horror. Basically, you had to be a big theatrical release or a high-profile direct-to-video release for me to catch it. And part of the reason why I enjoyed this much so much back then is because of all the feelings that came around with it. I felt like I was in this inner circle of horror that I had access to something that most of the general public would never check out. 
And watching it now, it's hard not to compare it to similar films that have done the same premise and they've done it much better. Um, the story just drops the ball, unfortunately. Like we know a lot about this, uh, a, a lot about this cult and their motives, but that doesn't make them interesting. And with Ryder Strong's character being really the only interesting out of the uh, interesting like character of the three that are dealing with this, it's just not enough to make the film that enjoyable to watch. So I'm hoping that uh, the rest of the films here in the After Dark Horror Fest for year two are going to give us an improvement because Borderland is going to get a two. A two out of five. The same score that Crazy Eights did, which is not a good average so far for this. But we got six films left to go through, y'all. So I want to know what you thought of it. Check it out. Borderland is available to rent and purchase on most streaming platforms right now. Go and check it out and let me know what you think of it, okay? Does it remind you of other films like Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning, like Vacancy, like Wrong Turn? Let me know if it's giving you those kind of vibes from watching it. But either way, make sure you stay tuned because, folks, we still got eight more films to review. Later this week, I'm going to have my reviews out for Lake Dead and The Deaths of Ian Stone. And the next week, we're going to handle our other four films that we're going to get through as well, okay? So... That's going to do it for me tonight. I appreciate y'all tuning in. Make sure to go like and subscribe, especially right now. Get on the Twitch because I am a, I'm playing Starship Troopers Extermination, the latest game to come out in the Starship Troopers universe. That's so awesome already. You want to catch gameplay, subscribe to me on Twitch so you can follow along as I jump into it. That's it for me tonight, though, folks. My name is T. We've been talking scary movies. Stay scared. I appreciate you tuning in for another brand new episode, movie review, game review, whatever it is now at this point. Don't forget, you want to get subscribed to my official channel so you can stay up to date for when I'm dropping new episodes, reviews, news, whatever it is. The best way to do that is get subscribed to my link tree. That's going to be linktr.ee slash tscarymovie. Again, linktr.ee slash tscarymovie. That'll keep you up to date with new videos, podcast links for the audio-only version, as well as my letterbox, where you can find written reviews. Get subscribed, and don't forget, keep watching scary movies, folks. Stay scared.